We're now joined by Dr. Ayodeji Olajide and Tunde Balogun, public health researcher and public health practitioner, respectively. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us under breakfast this morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. All right. Um, we'll start with you. Um, just asking your quick reaction to the minister's position. He's cautioning um, all of us to be ready for a possible a new wave. Do you think this is a real concern as well? Thank you for the question. Yes, this is a real concern. And I um, understand what the minister, Honorable Minister, has said. He's passionate about his work, yes, and he's passionate about the protection of the uh, life of Nigeria. But what we must realize, COVID is here to stay. That we understand. For United Kingdom to have decided to have a lockdown despite the down there, starting from Thursday, the second wave is already hitting them and they're counting millions of people that have been infected. But in Nigeria, look at our, look at our count. The head count is low. Just yesterday, just 111 people were tested positive. That brings the question. What are we doing that is either right or that is wrong? Now, when people come from Europe or from outside there to our airport, they have been screened for fever, to fill a form, and they are referred to certain centers to have their investigations done. Despite the fact that they are going to come in with a result, which says either they are positive or they're negative. Yes, that is a good step in the right direction. But the people we are screening in the country, are they not? The screening process for the indigenous, for the citizens of Nigeria, how genuine is this screening process? Come to think of it, the ILI and the ASARI, that um, influenza like illnesses and the severe acute respiratory illnesses, as an organization that has already laid down the foundation. Just about in 2014, ILI states that people that have fever, history of fever, greater than 38 degrees, with cough for 10 days should be screened for influenza-like illnesses. Then PARI, that's the Severe Acute Respiratory Infection Organization, came up and said, okay, what if it requires hospitalization? Then it is severe. This is the bedrock on which all or most chest infections have been treated or have been categorized before being treated. And it allows us to collect data. But NCDC has also gone a step further to have the criteria to, have the criteria to screen. The first one is to know suspected cases, to identify um, probable cases, and also confirm cases, and then decide, um, decide or define who the contact is. But I must confess, it's a far cry what they have put up as case definition compared to what WHO has done. With our own case definitions, we'll be missing some, if not all, of those that could be under suspected or probable, uh, probable uh, clients, those that are infected, suspected cases or probable cases. Let me elaborate. In suspected cases, the end is NCDC. They are only restricted to patients with or without fever, with respiratory um, symptoms, which may range from cough to shortness of breath or difficulty in breathing. The step is further to define um, people that have come in close contact or that live in an area that has been known to be endemic or have a high risk, moderate to high risk of having COVID-19 infection. But WHO says, no, you need to open it further. And what have WHO done? They decided to go ahead to define just not about um, respiratory uh, symptoms, but the effects of the respiratory um, syndrome vis-a-vis -vis disorientation, anosmia, loss of interest, loss of appetite, to the point of depression. Okay. So if 
Uh, do, do, Dr. Ayodeji. Yeah, hello. I kindly hold on. I, I, yes, so sir. don't get into um, um, uh, too uh, technical details. <laughs> um, but I, I, want, I want really for us to be able to establish um, what other countries may have done. Um, if you look at the story of uh, New Zealand, um, they've been you know, be able, to, able to give themselves a, a pass mark, I believe, with regards to their handling of COVID-19. Um, we're not very, it's not likely that they would, of course, be expecting a second wave. Of course, no one is sure. But in what ways would you say that we may have failed um, in handling the spread of this virus and we could have done better? So we, we have a minimal fears of a second wave. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you've asked right. Because I was trying to build a foundation earlier, right? And I've stated from where we got it a bit wrong. From defining what COVID-19 is for us and making a case uh, definition for it, other than what the WHO has done. That is the first step in probably the wrong direction. With this, we'll be missing cases that present in the hospital. How many people can have access to the investigation? It's too expensive. You're talking of 40 to 55,000 naira. You can check it out. That's expensive. In a country where the minimum wage is 18,000 naira, who's going to go out there and spend 40,000 naira on COVID-19? Except someone who's desperate to either leave the country or someone who has the means and knows that, oh, health is well. So many Nigerians will fall to the category. Very minimal. So we are doing less training compared to um, what other nations are doing. Then two, what are we doing about hygiene? In Japan, they've been into hand wash and use of face masks for, for years, since the time of the Hiroshima bombing. They decided to go about their hygiene in the proper direction. Are we doing likewise? Just take a peek through your window and look at the street. How 10 people walking a day on face masks. You'll be so shocked. In highly congested areas, like uh, let me not mention areas, you are going to be sure in suburbs that out of 10, only one will wear a face mask. And if you're using it rightly, definitely I can guarantee you that it's a no. That is true. Countries like New Zealand, just like you have mentioned, have done well. They've been able to reach out to the populace. They've been able to enlighten them. Are we doing that? Yes, we are doing that. But is it enough? I'll say no. How can we step this up? Children have resumed school today. I'm looking outside here now, and I've seen more than 50 kids. No one is being protected. Um, um, Dr. Olajide. They are going to school without it. Maybe they have kept their face mask in their, in their bag. Uh, Dr. Olajide. to ensure that it's done. And wash. As simple as it is. They are available in school because I know the criteria for schools to open. Uh, Dr. Olajide, let, let me interject and ask you this quickly. Um, you talked about the lack of adherence to some of these protocols. The uh, pr prominent thing, I was in Oweri recently, and I was shocked to see that nobody, absolutely nobody, was putting on a face mask. And somebody saw me with face mask and said, why am I deceiving myself? There is no COVID-19. And I'm not talking about someone who is um, uneducated. I'm talking about people that are highly educated. So is it more a question of inadequate publicity or the fact that aside the fatigue of the prolonged period of the pandemic and the disbelief that is being perpetrated is more to blame for this lack of ad adherence to um, uh, protocols that have been put in for our safety. That's the one part of the question. When you're done with it, I have another part. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're giving me a double barrel approach. <laughs> you're right with all what you say. It's what you call different strokes for different folks. If you ask a thousand people, many will tell you COVID-19 is a scam. People have made money from it. Uh, look at the palliatives that were kept somewhere. Hunger and people went there, packed everything. They still believe it was something formulated by the government to find some funds. So how can you now tell them that, no, it is real? Because they found bags of rice, sacks of food somewhere that runs into billions of them there. It's hard to convince such people. 
to uh, look at our healthcare facilities. They are still overwhelmed. Is the protocol still in line? Yes. But are people, are people adhering to such? No. I mean, we don't even need people to adhere. We need them to comply. Because there are two different things. Adherence and compliance. With adherence, we are forcing them. But with compliance, they understand. They know the implication. They are aware. So they take ownership. They take responsibility of their actions, of their activities. So the person will ensure that the face mask is in the vehicle. I have like 10 face masks, despite the fact that I don't need it. But look at you, you're in the office now. You're not on face mask. Are you? No, because we are in a studio in a confined space so, and we're both negative and there is a bit of a social distance between us. <laughs> interesting wearing a face mask on, that's uh, on the screen this morning. That's very reasonable. I understand that. That's very reasonable. But people look at you outside will not understand that. You do understand. They right, see um, you on TV on there and they're like, ah, you know, face mask. They don't, they don't know what the one meter distance is all about. They right, don't do, want do, to be in contact with someone who's probable, like a probable case or a confirmed case. What yeah, Dr. Uh, Ayodeji, um, so, so hold on. I, I want us to now bring in, um, we'll come back to you, Dr. Ayodeji. Um, we're going to go now to Dr. Tunde Balogun, who's also just uh, stepped in. Uh, good morning and welcome, Dr. Balogun. Can you hear us, sir? Yes, I can. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. We can Thanks for joining us. Welcome. So I, I want to bring in um, one of the statements um, Dr. Olajide um, had already uh, said. He said, COVID is here to stay. Um, do you think from, you know, the way that we've also set up our um, COVID-19 fights, you know, for Nigeria um, with the people and their uh, level of awareness with the investments in the health sector um, generally, um, do you think, you know, that we should be worried um, seeing also that the moves that are being made across the world to find the vaccine haven't produced anything yet. Should Nigerians be worried? There is a strong ground for worry in Nigeria. Uh, the reasons are obvious. Health uh, communication and information is about the most difficult aspect of communication. Globally. So, and the reason is because um, practitioners are training to understand um, behaviors of I mean, human behaviors is not uh, deep enough, and therefore to communicate easily for people okay. to I make the right the network, choices uh, is not easy. Because you are, you are trying to compare. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Balogun, Dr. Balogun, um, please, we will, we will come back to you. In, uh, the, the audio is not so good at the moment. I'm sure some persons are straining to uh, hear what you're saying. We'll come back to you in a bit. Uh, we'll come back to uh, Dr. Ola Jide. Um, the second part of my question has to do with the concerns raised by the minister um, about the disruption caused by the NSARS protest. We do know that during that period there was an absolute lack of um, recognition uh, that we had a COVID-19 still. Uh, you also um, alluded to the fact that uh, we might not be doing adequate testing. This is not the position that's being held by the NCDC. They say that in spite of increased testing, we have lesser figure. Where is the place of the earlier assumption that the weather in this country might play a role in reducing the number of infections we have? And what do we do to increase the number of testing, especially with the concerns of costing uh, that you alluded to earlier? Uh, thank you for the question. Hey, these are multiple questions. You've gone through A, B, C, D for me. Huh? <laughs> All right, I'll try I'm sorry, just do what you can with it. OK, I'll try as much as possible to be simple. Um, now, the entire saga um, I brought I brought down the light in our heart. If, if you notice, we all came together, some united us, and um, 
for the soul's loss, uh, it's painful, but let's get back to this. It would have taken just one person with COVID-19 to be in that crowd to have spread to a thousand. Now imagine those thousands going home to their loved ones, and they have at least three to four people at home, that's three to four thousand. Those loved ones have people that care for to go to the most quickly and react to the So it was a disaster, and we are yet to know what the repercussion would be. Then two, with the issue of testing. Yes, NCDC has increased the uh, number of tests they've done, they, they do, and they're still encountering or bringing up low figures. Ask the question, who are they training? Have they gone to the suburb, to the highly congested areas to screen people? And what methods are they using? If you look at what they are using, you need to check the sensitivity and the specificity of the test reagent. How true positives, how positives you can get, those are positive. And those that are not positive, how are you going to be sure they're not positive? So those are the questions there. Three, how can they improve the screening process? As simple as it is, screening is supposed to pick people out, not to diagnose. Government has gone through the hard way, which they believe is the only way, by going ahead to try and diagnose, which is expensive. They resulted in making it expensive and people cannot afford it. What do I mean by that? The, the, the mode of investigation, without a cumbersome, um, they have loads of investigations to do. The machines to use are way too more expensive. That's why the result I expect is that people have to pay hard earned money to get the test done. And look at the timeline. It's about five days. Who does that in this, in this, right. in this time and age? You do test on the spot, you get the, res the result in the next four or five hours, and you're on the move. Five days of your life will be on hold. And that's terrible enough. Do you, okay. you, know, do you know the amount of manpower loss that could have Dr. Okay, Lajide, we're, 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 we're going to, of course, um, uh, put you on pause there to quickly bring in Dr. Tunde Balogun once again. Uh, we had lost him uh, earlier. Dr. Tunde, welcome back. Thank you. I think All it's right. better now. I Much think, better. yes, we can hear you clearly now. I, I, I was asking earlier about, you know, reasons, you know, well, I think we've lost him again. Uh, are you still there, sir? No, I'm here. Okay, yeah, brilliant. I so I was asking earlier about um, you know, what it looks like. You know, if, if uh, Dr. Lajid earlier mentioned that uh, COVID-19 is not going away, it's here to stay. Should we be worried in Nigeria seeing that there is no current you know, vaccine for COVID-19? And second, um, what are your thoughts on what we should have learned from the year 2020 moving into our health budget? For 2021, um, does it seem like we've learned anything and we've made better investments in healthcare moving forward? Thank you so much. Um, I stated earlier that the basis for worry is still very much with us because uh, the, the numbers globally keep rising. And we have um, uh, the case, case number of cases, the incidence rate growing globally. And the fact that we still do not have um, uh, a vaccine anywhere to take care of uh, COVID-19 uh, means that we'll continue to have a rise. And I was discussing something earlier on talking about health communication and how people respond to health information. Now, the worry is that if we don't communicate properly, if we don't meet the, if we don't marry our communication with the sociocultural uh, parameters, present in every country, particularly for us in Nigeria here, uh, we will be speaking above the head of, of our um, audience. So if people regard uh, COVID-19, there's all kinds of myths that have been in the air uh, in Nigeria here. In fact, I, I remember um, the 5G uh, link with uh, COVID-19 was rife, not only in Nigeria, globally. And so if all those, I mean, something as strange as uh, 5G technology uh, correlating with um, incidents of COVID-19, um, so you can understand how health, in, um, the challenge of communicating health messages could be for um, public health practitioners and, and, and doctors in general. 
and and therefore you um and we've seen a rise in um, uh, social gathering. Um, the government itself has tried to relax as much as possible. Um, schools are open, borders are open, churches are open. And, and this all provide, I, I think a, a couple of um, weeks ago, we also saw people gathering for one reason or the other against the state. And um, protocols for COVID-19 were almost completely ignored. And I think there was also um, a concern raised by the, the chairman of the NCDC then, and even the minister, that um, such um, could, um, we should expect a spike in, in, two, in two weeks thereabouts. But the concern we have now is that the number of cases that we have is not just commensurate with the risk of COVID-19 that we have. The risk of COVID-19 is high because we don't um, um, follow um, C-19 protocols here uh, as much as we should. And even in countries where they seem to be um, um, co co um, cooperating with the authorities. We have seen that um, second wave of COVID-19 has already set in. Uh, and the, the idea is that we want to see how we can promote uh, economic activities and grow the economy. It, it, um, Nigeria, for instance, is almost, um, it's almost said that perhaps we will be heading for recession. So these are cons genuine concerns, but they, they will remain worried for us because as long as people do not observe COVID-19, protocols it will be a concern and, and your question about lessons learned from 29 2020 with regards to our health um our approach as a government as a country to um, health indices and then um health budgeting and uh expenditure i i, I can't truly really say that we we've, we've learned much so far based on um, the figures um and are staring us we saw as a people so on the part of the people uh, we saw uh, pictures of health facilities that were vandalized. It seems to me that perhaps people do not understand uh, the social nature of health. And uh, I mean, uh, vandalizing health facilities, who is losing? Is it the people or the government? Then we saw on the part of the government itself, um, we've seen um, how they've communicated um, COVID-19 and the budgeting um, since COVID-19 in Nigeria, we've seen um, doctors go on strike maybe two times. We've seen allied health workers go on strike at least once, threatening to go on strike. So um, does it show that um, all parties, all stakeholders to COVID-19, we are learning in this country? It is not obvious. So these are genuine concerns for everyone as we move into 2021. All right. I, I want to ask you quickly your take on the alleged vaccine that has been uh, developed by Russia, even though WHO um, has not um, approved it. What is your thinking? Is there maybe too much protocol being put in, in front of us actually having a vaccine? Because a lot of work has been expended towards getting one. Well, uh, so vaccine, the primary way vaccine works is that someone who is um, uh, who is not exposed to a particular disease, a vaccine is produced and administered to the person such that there's some form of immunity developed in that person. And when the person is now faced with the disease itself, the person has already been exposed to something mild uh, to which the body has developed immunity. So the body is seeing that disease second time and is not responding to it the first time. So the body can then fight and overcome that disease. That's how, um, that's just the basic way vaccines work. And to get to that, because vaccine, um, there are a number of ways you produce vaccine. So I don't, don't let me go into those details. But at, at the end of the day, you are administering something that would uh, uh, develop immunity in people. Because of the way it works, they are, set, they are genuine concerns to giving approvals to vaccines. And I can understand, um, besides the policies that may be involved, that protocols for production of vaccine and, and uh, mass, mass production of vaccine and use of vaccine must be adhered to. So uh, it's commendable that we have vaccines at the moment. Um, the general um, belief is that we will not have it in commercial quantities until perhaps the first quarter of 2021. So we have to follow through that process. As much as we want to hasten and speed up, we just need to ensure that 
uh, um, safeties of concern, not just only efficacy. So we have to bear this in mind. And for us, I think um, WHO is also trying to um, raise their funds so that third world countries can also benefit because I can imagine the cost of um, uh, the vaccines when eventually they are available. So, uh, uh, all and right, therefore, now, we'll, uh, WHO is raising funds to ensure that we can have it in abundance when um, uh, the C-19 vaccines are eventually um, mass produced for the world. All right, we'll take that same question to uh, Dr. Dr. Olajide. Olajide. Um, could you quickly uh, speak on it? Because uh, aside from Russia, we know that some persons have come up to say that we have reached an advanced stage, enough for the world to accept that there is a vaccine. Uh, the case in point we're talking about now is Russia. What's uh, your two cents on that conversation? Well, um, thank you for the question. Just like my colleague and friend said about that, uh, international politics, you really can't meddle in it if you don't know much about it. Um, there's a protocol before vaccines are uh, released out to the public. Even in times of trial, when they are tried, there's a protocol for it for that to occur, that process. And for you to release it out to the public, there's also a protocol. If it doesn't meet up with what WHO defines as um, uh, being ready, then they will definitely go against it. Who funds them? Who funds the WHO? You know, those are questions you and I cannot really answer. Okay? Um, you and I say what the, uh, the, the, chart, the pathway in which Russia has called. Is it legal? Uh, well, we can't really say much about that. So... I think that's left for international organizations to, to decide if it's worth it. But I know that Russia has a duty to protect our citizens. So they will do the right thing for their citizens. And whatever is right for their citizens may be right for other people's citizens, if their government permits so. I think that's just the simple politics about it. All right. Um, Thank you. I think that's uh, most of the time that we have this morning, uh, Dr. Uh, Tunde Balogu and, of course, uh, Dr. Ayo Deji Olajide. Thank you both for speaking with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Dr. Balogu, bye-bye. Okay. Okay, bye. Okay, <laughs> why? Have a good day. Now. We we'll hope to speak <laughs> to you <laughs> soon. Um, uh, yeah, just to um, say quickly that um, a lot of skepticism, um, the world has seen so much um, um, untrue from, you know, bodies and organizations. So the ones that are saddled with the responsibility of confirming has a huge task not to make a mistake. And yes. that's what I think the WHO is actually doing. They're trying to cross all their T's and dot all their I's. But a lot of countries, in Israel, for instance, I understand, has begun human trials of the COVID-19 vaccine. We know that even America, there is um, one that they are, you know, FDA has come up I'm to say UK, it's, also, yes, yes. It, it's a possible um, a cure or a mitigation of an elongation of the time that people stay uh, to get a cure. But we are hopeful. Um, I am optimistic that we will get through this uh, as well. And uh, it's imperative, like the doctors um, have, uh, you know, stressed, that people should remember we still have a pandemic on our hands. So the use of face mask is not for fashion. You see people put it on and it's under their nose or under their chin. It's supposed to cover your nose and your mouth, please. This is the social responsibility thing that we must uh, reiterate. Wear your mask proper hand hygiene, and hopefully we can stay away from uh, getting uh, the virus. I'm also, you know, going to quickly share that um, um, I feel that we also need to uh, move away from, because it, when you asked about the Russian vaccine, you know, and he mentioned international politics, 
Um, I, I hope that we can also, or they can also understand that, you know, lives need to be saved, you know, before politics is played, you know, then people need to be alive. I agree. Um, and I'm also really concerned about what we're truly learning uh, from this. If we have our health budget for, Nigeria's health budget for 2021, and it doesn't seem very different from, you know, what we've been having in the past, and it doesn't seem like we've understood the need to invest more and to fund um, our health care better, we need to in every way do better because we've seen... We, maybe we would say luckily for Nigeria, it hasn't been as bad as it, it is in even South Africa and other countries. But we've seen the need to invest more in healthcare at a time like this. We've seen the need to to put in more work, you know, with regards. Yeah, to, doctors to, to, are still running out of Nigeria in, 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 in waves. Yeah, aside um, from the government, something you said earlier, I think, uh, the current... Uh, the the earlier situation we had with the protest also has created the lack of, uh, you know, understanding among uh, Nigerians that they too have a responsibility to safeguard what little infrastructure we had. I mean, I do not understand the looting of hospitals where people are to be treated. Um, so it's so, not so just in, in government. A, in, in a really. situation where there is a protest and there is rioting and you know there is. Um, almost anarchy you don't select what you loot and you don't loot it's it's it's, it's quite so unfortunate i'm not gonna, that, that I'm we, not gonna have a protest you know, blame, i'm not gonna blame the people and say oh you know you should have touched here but don't touch here no it's it's chaos and that's everyone is going to be a victim of that chaos well, i'm gonna it, go it, back we're still human I'm gonna being, go back. even when we're angry doesn't, for me it doesn't and then matter you can loot something else but I'm gonna that go same, back. the same facility gonna, that we take care of you when you were sick the same you way you go there the and destroy way, what happens to you when you fall sick it is the same way i'm not going Going to say oh it's okay that you looted this person's shop but you left the hospital every person who suffered from the violence and from the looting did it maybe didn't deserve it i'm going to always go back and say the government should have done better to protect lives and property the government who put a curfew in place should have done better to ensure that there was enough security during a curfew but that, We're does, currently not, that living... does not take away our responsibility as a people i was having no this conversation and somebody was saying that felicity you sound naive when you say that no we are human beings first Felicity. before we have emotions taking over. So if you destroy what we have, it is still us that will pay taxes. It is still us that will build, rebuild this um, 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 outfits that we are destroying. It is still us that there will is, suffer the increase in insecurity. We'll spend more time on this, but there's a reason there is that <laughs> many people who are jobless and do not care about these infrastructure. There's, there's a reason there's millions of people who are angry enough to not care when they're destroying a hospital. I see your when point. When they're destroying government infrastructure. There is a reason. So I'm, I'm always going to go back to that reason. I'm not going to blame that poor man who got frustrated and has lost someone um, to police brutality. Let's also not yeah, forget Well, I, I think we're being told to end this. I, I was more concerned about the health aspect. Uh, well, no, no there, there's no, oh, you can yeah. destroy a police station, but don't destroy a hospital. There's nothing like that. Or you can destroy, you know, these people's businesses, but don't destroy a hospital. Doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> All right. We, we agree to disagree. Hello. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.